Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaas and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program coming to you live from Washington, D.C. We are uncovering each part of the DFARS, or Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern. As you know, the DFARS are the rule books for contracting with the Defense Department. We've been moving sequentially, so we started with DFARS Part 201 in January, and we'll be finishing with Part 253 in December. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. Um, they're recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 450 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So if you do have questions for our speaker, we will have his information on the last slide of the presentation today. Virginia PTAC at GMU offers free one-on-one -on -one counseling to firms in Virginia on federal, state, and local procurement topics. Online resources and group trainings are free with no restriction on business location. If you're interested in learning more, please use the links provided to explore what PTACs can offer. Set Aside Alert provides up-to-date news, information, and opportunities for small business federal contractors. Their daily opportunities alerts assure you won't miss important sources, thought, and solicitation announcements, providing details you can jump on the hot ones. Every two weeks, they deliver concise breaking news, events, regulations, and teaming opportunities. And please join the Reston Chamber of Commerce Government Contractors Council for regular meetings. You can contact Alicia Field with the email shown on your screen if you have any questions. Okay, now a little bit about us. Um, we work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles in compliance, and more information can be found on our website. I also wanted to inform you of a new series that we're holding this year. Um, we have launched a monthly series called the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. And this is a live webinar series held each month. Um, and these will take place on the second Friday of each month this year at 12 p.m. Eastern. We have assembled a group of four panelists who are subject matter experts on a specific federal contracting topic. The panelists will make a short presentation about the topics listed here on your screen and then take your live questions about that topic. Our panelists include attorneys, consultants, and other industry professionals. And you can sign up on our website under the Q&A Cafe tab. Sponsorships are available. Please email hello at jennifershouse.com for a media kit with pricing details. Also, please note that you can use code DFARS for a $15 discount on each of these webinars. So more specifically, um, next week, on September 10th, our panelists will be covering oral presentations, and that will be with Rena, Troy, Andres, and Deborah. And then in October, um, we are covering set-asides with Anna, Eric, Sai, and Tim. On November 12th, we get into pricing with Michael, Marsha, Tracy, and Jess. And lastly, in December, our speakers Shirley, Joshua, Kate, and Brad will present on M&A. Again, the discount code is DFARS, and you can save $15, bringing your cost to $20 per webinar. I also wanted to highlight an additional webinar we're holding this year. Um, the title of the webinar is Fiscal New Year Kickoff Best Practices, um, and that will be on October 1st at 12 p.m. Both the sponsor link and registration link can be found on your screen and on our website. Our speakers will be covering market research, marketing, sales and capture, proposal writing, and compliance. Sponsorships are also available for this webinar. Please email hello at jennifershouse.com for pricing details. Okay, now to introduce our speaker, Adam Munitz. Welcome, Adam. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. 
Thanks, Hunter, and thanks for uh, having me speak today. Really great to be on. Um, my name is Adam Munitz. I'm a partner at FHNH Law Firm based out of Tyson's. We are a one-stop shop, full-service law firm for government contractors, focusing primarily on the defense and security sectors. Um, my uh, practice focuses on government contracts and international trade compliance. I run our international trade compliance practice at the firm. And today we'll be focusing on DFARS Part 237. So next slide, please. And that specifically pertains to service contracting. Next slide, please. So I think that there's a tendency in the government contract sector to um, think about the FAR, the DFARS, is in a somewhat myopic way and only focus on the provisions on the parts and the subparts that contain you know, very specific information for contractors and to ignore other parts and subparts that don't necessarily contain that kind of rich level of information that's directed towards government contractors specifically. And I think that's a mistake. Um, I've always believed that there's something to be gleaned from every single part and subpart of the FAR and DFAR, no matter how obscure it is. And that's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to take um, a more strategic approach to this particular subpart um, we'll look at, yes, some, some tactical guidance as well with respect to different kinds of services. But we're also going to look at some of these subparts that on their face don't seem particularly useful to government contractors, but at least from my perspective, do contain a lot of really useful information. Um, I've listed here some of the, uh, the parts and subparts. We won't focus on all of these, but as you can see, again, um, part 237 describes several types of service contracts for DOD and the processes and structures around them. Some of them, as you can see, are, are, are very niche. And for that reason, we're not going to look at them. It doesn't make them any less um, useful. But, you know, for instance, mortuary services, laundry services, those are very niche services. Um, if you're in those sectors, I encourage you to, to look at those. Um, we could, again, benefit from them too, but we're just not going to dive deeply into those today. Next slide, please. So again, and, you know, I'm going to repeat, <laughs> repeat this theme over and over again, but consistent with this theme of, of deriving value from provisions that on their face don't seem that valuable, um, we can look at subparts 102.74 to 102.78. Um, and there's not a, doesn't seem to be a whole lot there that's useful. Um, however, if you look at subpart 102-74, which covers the taxonomy for the acquisition of services, that section in turn references um, Procedures, Guidance, and Information, Section 237.102-74. And that very clearly outlines the different um, services and the portfolio groups that together comprise the, the contracting services on which this subpart focuses. And I think this is useful because it, should, it really gives government contractors a sense of the breadth of this section, the breadth of services that can be provided to DOD. Um, to those that are new to government contracting, um, it can seem as if DOD only procures you know, military hardware, military services, um, and you know, services that tie directly to, um, to hardware. That that's, could not be farther from the truth. I mean, when you look at these services, you'll see that there's a broad array of, of services that are there to keep DOD functioning. Um, to those of you that are you know, steeped in government contracting, that, that's a no-brainer. It's obvious. For those of you that are newer to it, you'll see there's a lot of opportunity here. There are a lot of services that DOD desperately needs. Um, everything from housekeeping and social services to installation of equipment to dentistry services. There's a lot of room for entrepreneurial government contractors to be a part of that, that DOD acquisition process. So I think that that in of itself is, is useful. Next slide, please. And I would note that throughout this presentation, we have included hyperlinks to some of these resources so you can access them yourself. Subpart 10275, again, on its face, not particularly useful, but it does reference the Defense Acquisition Guidebook, and Chapter 10 touches specifically on services. That's an incredibly useful resource. Um, it can give invaluable insight into internal processes, roles and responsibilities, program requirements, quality assurance surveillance plans, which we call QASPs. All of that background information is useful. Um, you know, taking this information, incorporating it into your business strategy, is honestly what separates you know the 
relatively um, you know normal government contractors from from those that really really succeed by adopting a more strategic mindset. So I would encourage those of you that are for not not familiar with that guidebook and not familiar with chapter ten specifically to really dive deep into that and review it as as much as you can. Next slide. Okay, section one hundred two seven six. We thought that. Um, that this would be useful to review um, in particular because you get a sense of the review criteria. Um, and we'll go over those in a second, but just to make an important distinction, these are not the, um, the criteria against which your bids and proposals um, would, be, would be assessed. Um, there are separate criteria for those that, that are managed on a case-by-case -case basis. What these do are outline the criteria against which the contracting officers must, must be developing you know, their procurement strategies. And there's a strategic way to use these, right? Um, you can either look at these and say, well, no, that's just really for, for government, you know, for contracting officer um, utilization, that's for them to understand. Well, no, I mean, if you really want to develop a, a successful bid, I would say, you know, comply no, not only with the specific um, RFP and solicitation requirements, but also understand these criteria in section 102-76, at least for services, and as much as possible, try and engineer your, your bids, your proposals in such a way that they are complying, or, or maybe furthering is a better word, furthering the objective of the contracting officer. So the more you can shape your bid or your proposal in such a way that, that these boxes are checked for the contracting officer, I'd say, you know, the more successful your, your approach will be. Um, next slide, please. I won't go through these in detail. There are two matrices here, one for pre-award, one for post-award. But here you can see these are the criteria with which contracting officers must comply. Um, it covers a range of range of topics, most of which should be intuitive to you, acquisition, acquisition strategy, performance management, conflict of interest, socioeconomic considerations, um, period of performance. All of these criteria can be useful to government contractors when they're shaping their bids and proposals, um, even if they're not reflected in your specific um, RFP or solicitation that you're responding to. Next slide, please. Same thing here, um, similar matrix, um, do your best to review these, understand them, and shape your bid and proposals in such a way, obviously pr prioritizing the, uh, the criteria for the particular RFP or solicitation, but trying to address these and, and understand them as well. Next slide. Subpart 102-77 um, contains the acquisition requirements roadmap tool. Um, Again, doesn't seem that useful on its face because it's geared towards contracting officer, but this can be an incredibly valuable resource for government contractors because of the templates um, that it includes. Everything from performance work statements to QASPs, to performance requirements summaries, um, and of course they can be modified by you know, procurement shops, but you know, understanding these templates, reviewing these templates, utilizing them wherever possible, um, that, can, you know, that can be incredibly useful um, and can really be baked into your, your acquisition strategy as a whole. We've included the, uh, the link as well. Next slide, please. Subpart 102-78, um, Market Research Report Guide for Improving Tradecraft and Services Acquisition. Um, I know it's going to start to sound repetitive, right, if it hasn't already, but this is clearly geared towards contracting officers in terms of how they should conduct their market research. But if we take a step back and try to think about this more creatively and strategically, this guide will help you understand how the government conducts and how specifically DOD conducts its market research. So if you want to be a part of that process, if you want to be part of that dialogue, you'll see there here that you know, the, the Department of Defense is looking at trade journals, it's looking at conferences, it's looking at trade shows, symposia, um, it's looking at outreach to industry professionals. The better you can understand that market research process, the more you can be a part of it, the more plugged in you can be with the DOD um, process, and the more you can really help shape um, the way DOD procures goods and services, in this case, services. So again, I, I would strongly encourage those of you that are not familiar with this subpart to really do a deep dive and understand um, how that's useful and how you, can, how you can utilize it to your own benefit. Next slide. Okay, I'd say that this subpart 102-79 is a little bit more tactical um, and is, I think, much more useful on its face. To the extent that you're providing a service and 
the government decides to insource that service, that is provide that service in-house instead of utilizing um, your, your services, there's a process in place for that. And as you can see here, the contracting officer must provide a written notification describing why the service is now being insourced to affected contractors within 20 days of the decision. Um, so if you find out um, that your service has been insourced and does not comply with this requirement, um, if it does not include a summary of the final determination, if it doesn't check these boxes, then connect with your counsel um, to understand whether there's any sort of recourse you have and whether it was in fact insourced in an appropriate manner. Um, so again, I think this is more, more tactical guidance, but really very useful to the extent that, that DOD insources your services. Next slide. This subpart 170 just goes through the, through the approval requirements for services acquired by a DOD, whether or not they're acquired through a DOD contract or a contractor task order or ordered by, you know, indirectly by another agency. I'll just go through this. Um, for all acquisitions of non-performance based services, if the contract price is at or below 100 million, approval of an official designated by the department or agency must be obtained. If the contract price exceeds 100 million, approval of the senior procurement official must be obtained. And you know, obviously the need to obtain specific approvals could impact the overall types of contracts procurement officials make available. Again, you know, I think this is more of a strategic subpart. It's essential to understand how the contract awards are made, how those decisions are made, who's making them. Um, if you're going to develop a really robust and informed um, sales strategy with respect to your services, you have to understand the level at which these decisions are being made so you can adjust accordingly. Next slide. So part 172 addresses service contract surveillance, um, and that's you know, managed primarily through the QASP um, that we talked about before. And as we note here, they must be prepared by the government contracting authority, the GCA, during the bidding. Um, it, you know, these documents specify how the government will verify the quality services are being received in the contract. It's essentially the, the, the guidebook um, that the government will use to ensure that performance is satisfactory. And on its face, again, this looks like something that's really not useful to contractors, but I'd say it's essential. You know, understand exactly how the QASPs work for your particular services. Um, you know, that's that's how your performance is going to be assessed throughout the contract. Um, so it, it seems to me like a no-brainer that you would understand these QASPs, um, understand how they're developed, understand what they require if you're going to really ensure that your performance is on point and not only meets but exceeds the government's expectations. Understand the metrics by which they're going to be you know, surveilling your, your contract performance. And of course, you, know, you should be prepared to provide data on your quality control measures um, that you're taking to ensure that you, you comply with the QASP. Next slide. Okay, now we're going to dive into some of the um, specific services. I think this, is, this guidance is a little more tactical. Um, Subpart 10270 addresses the prohibition on contracting for firefighting or security guard functions. Um, Subpart 109 addresses services of quasi-military armed forces. Um, 102-71 addresses the limitation on service contracts for military flight simulators. What's valuable about these subparts, and the reason we chose to address these, is that these put um, limitations on the extent to which the DOD can acquire these services. So for example, um, as stated up top, DOD cannot enter contracts, enter into contracts for firefighting or military installation or facility security guard function unless um, you know, meeting the needs of the installation or facility would require members of the armed forces, forces to be taken away from other duties. Um, and then, of course, all performance has to be effectively supervised. Similar limitation for um, military flight simulators. Typically, DOD cannot enter into a contract to acquire those simulators unless it's determined to be in the national interest through a waiver to the Secretary of Defense. I think that this is really useful information to those that are in these particular services, right? If you're providing firefighting services, if you're providing um, quasi-military armed forces services, if you're in the service sector that, that touches uh, military flight simulators, you should of course understand um, the limitations on the procurement of those services and make sure that you're adjusting your, your strategy accordingly and adjusting your, your pitch accordingly and understand that, that they may not be as open to market as you might think. 
Next slide, please. Similarly, um, subpart 102-72 addresses the limitation on management services. And specifically, DOD can only award um, contracts for these services um, where the contract prohibits the contractor from performing inherently governmental functions, right? There's a limit on the substance of what you can provide there. And of course, the DOD organization responsible for the development of production of the major system ensures federal employees are responsible for determining courses of action to be taken in the best interest of the government and best technical performance of the warfighter, right? So there is, sir, there's some serious oversight requirements here. Um, we'd also note, as indicated here, that the provision also prohibits the prime from advising or recommending the award of a contract or subcontract for the development or production of the major system to an entity obviously owned in whole or in part by the prime contractor. Um, you know, there are a lot of companies that focus on precisely these types of management services. Um, they are you know, provided without much oversight in the private sector. Obviously, in the public sector, if you're advising DOD in this capacity, that can be incredibly valuable. But there are various conflicts of interest um, requirements and, and other precautionary measures to ensure that, that there is a, a dividing line between the private sector and the public sector when it comes to the provision of these services. So, again, if you're in that sector, it's important to understand the parameters around um, management services. Next slide. Right, so we just note under subpart 104 um, that similarly to the, to the other one for management services, personal service contracts for experts or consultants will only be authorized when the position supports the national defense, but the need cannot be met by a current DOD employee. Um, there's a temporal limitation here. All personal service contracts must last no longer than a year and may be either temporary or intermittent. So again, um, given the risk that these services could become inherently governmental, and that the private sector could, you know, just start to, um, you know, merge to an inappropriate extent with the public sector. There are limitations put here on when those types of personal services can be uh, can be acquired. Next slide. This is very niche. It's a more strategic guidance. I won't go through it in detail, um, but obviously, given the sensitivity surrounding um, detainees and interrogation. There are limits on exactly um, what kind of services can be provided with respect to those um, with respect to those categories, um, when they can be provided, and the training that must be provided to personnel performing those services. So, I mean, to those of us that are not in these sectors, you know, it can sound very very niche, but there are, there are actually a fair number of companies that can specialize in work surrounding these areas. Um, so, to the extent you do or you kind of touch these sectors in an attenuated way, make sure you understand these limitations so you can develop your strategy um, and your obviously your training strategy for your personnel accordingly. Next slide. So here we've just listed um, a variety of services that are also covered by subpart 237. They're, they're very specialized, so we're not going to go through them here. Um, but to the extent you are in any of these services or you have a broader portfolio that could, in, you know, could encompass these services or you're, you're considering expanding into these, these sectors, please be sure to review these subparts. Um, they do contain detailed tactical guidance on um, how these particular contracts are awarded. Next slide. Again, more tactical guidance um, at subpart 237.72 on educational service agreements. Um, I think it's important to note that you know, the parameters surrounding these, particularly for educational service, um, it's an ordering agreement under which the Department of Defense pays normal fees and tuition for educational services, and enrollment is done under the institution's normal rules. Um, there's a template for these agreements at that subpart 237.7204. and um, and again, if you're in the you know the services of students at research and development laboratories, if you're involved in that R&D, then be sure to understand 237.73. Next slide. I think this is probably the last substantive slide we have here. Um, obviously, given what the Department of Defense does, given its its portfolio, um, much of what's provided to the Department of Defense could be deemed essential. And that's that's you know un unique, um, and it's important for contractors doing business with DoD to understand that their services could be deemed 
essential. Um, and they should be prepared to continue providing those services during times of crisis, right? So that's, that's obviously, that's, that's dissimilar from the, the private sector. Um, if you're going to choose to contract with DOD, understand that your services may be deemed essential and that you may have to continue providing them however mundane you think they are in the big scheme of things um, during, during crises. And consistent with that, contractors must also provide a written plan as to how services will be continued during crisis that will be incorporated into the final contract. Um, you know, work with the government contracting officer to assess the sufficiency and eventually approve this plan. Um, but note that because the terms of the plan will be incorporated into the final contract, it's particularly important to ensure the plan contains a realistic and achievable approach to services. While it's crucial to develop a plan um, that will you know, allow the services to continue being provided during, during crises, it's also important that they be realistic and achievable, right? It's part of your contract. So you have to find that balance between being proactive and providing durable services that can be provided during crises, but also providing services or providing a mitigation plan that's realistic and won't jeopardize your, your performance itself. Next slide. So that wraps up my, my presentation on subpart 237. Um, you know, I know that this was relatively short. I think that this is one of those sections that can be addressed relatively briefly. But again, um, if, if you haven't heard enough already, I do think that this subpart and many other subparts in DFARS should be viewed through, through that strategic lens, right? Figure out a way to incorporate those subparts into your business strategy. Learn as much as you can about the way that the government approaches procurement and approaches contract awards, even if on their face, those, those parts or subparts don't seem relevant to what you do. Um, my contact information is here. Um, we enjoy discussing these, these topics. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, thank you to Jennifer and her team for having me on. And thank you to my colleague, uh, Megan Pastor for helping put this presentation together. Thank you, Adam, for a great presentation and for sharing your time with us today. Um, and like Adam said, definitely reach out if you have any questions. Um, about any of the content in today's um, webinar. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Um, the recording will be posted on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. And please join us next week as we cover more parts of the DFARS. Have a good week, everyone.